Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. And yes, you asked for it. We finally sat down with Dave Rubin. And of course, we talked about Star Wars as the ultimate libertarian tale. And we also talked about social justice warriors. And I tried to talk him off the ledge about why the future is going to be awesome. Check it out. Dave Rubin, thanks for joining us. You went through heroic efforts to get here, and I really appreciate you making time for us. It's good to be here. I'm sorry that I'm not drinking booze and I'm just going with the coffee, but I, I do have a speech to give, and I'm doing this paleo thing, and it's just the combination. For well, me. you do what you have to do, and, and we're non judgmental here yeah. mostly. I will drink after yeah. my, you talk. Yeah. Yeah. But before, so I'm 50 50 on that. So you don't believe in. in drunk speeches and just see what's going to happen? Not really. You know, twice in my stand-up years, I went on stage stoned, and both times were absolutely horrible. Yeah, that's, horrible. That's there must have been a couple drunk times, or not not drunk, like stupid drunk, but like buzz times. Yeah, no. I'd rather have just whatever like a, wits I still have about me, I'd rather keep them. It was a completely silent set, right? And, it was just terrible. Actually, the one, the one that I really remember, the stone time, was the night that, do you remember, this must be about... 99 or so when JFK Jr. Remember when he was missing before they found the yeah, plane yeah. crashed? There was about a 24-hour window where they didn't know where he was. And I don't know what I was thinking. I smoked a joint backstage with some comedians and I walked on stage and I said they found JFK Jr. He's alive. And the crowd went crazy. And then I didn't even have a joke. I was just like, oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and it, I just bombed. I mean, it was terrible. So. Well, you you apparently got out alive because I could see where that, <laughs> that could go horribly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did make it out alive. Yeah. yeah. So big news today. Yes. Um, Palpatine. I'm very excited. The Emperor. Yeah. Um, and you are a. I'm glad bona, we're starting here. Bonafide Star Wars dork. Yes. Um, you you can you can come out and and be honest about nerd it here. geek. Loser, yeah. Any what's, of those. what's the deal? Like, what's your read on this? Well, I've been tweeting lately um, that I think as the years go by, that the prequels are going to be looked back at more and more fondly because if you can actually remove the bad acting, and you have to remove that, the acting is pretty much terrible, except for Palpatine. I would say the rest of the acting is pretty awful. You can remove that, and you can remove the really stiff dialogue. I mean, George Lucas, unfortunately. You know, I love the guy, and it's it's sort of unfortunate that we all have these weird attachments to him now because some of this has gone a little haywire. But he can't really write really good romantic dialogue. He could write like crisp, popping things with originally with Han Solo and and Leia. Like yeah. that was like real. Yeah. Like it wasn't romantic. It was like you know, it was it was sort of dirty, and you didn't know exactly what was happening, and it was fun, fun more than anything else. Um, but if you can remove the bad acting and the bad dialogue. The the story of the and, prequels. And Jar Jar Binks. And well, naturally, I didn't even. I felt I didn't we even can, have we can to. We do that. I right? felt I didn't even have to say it. The technology um, is there. We we could do that, and we yeah. probably should do that. And do you know that there's a deleted scene from Phantom Menace? If you get the you know the DVD or whatever, that uh, the DVD. What year is this? <laughs> whatever people do to watch things now. Uh, one of the deleted scenes is that they were going to kill Jar Jar at the beginning of Phantom Menace. Did you know that when when they get out of the water when they're coming up? I would I would have uh, paid to see that. Yeah. yeah. So there's a scene that's that was never fully finished where right as Obi Wan and Qui Gon Jinn get out of the little ship that they were in when they were getting up to Naboo that he's still in the ship and it goes over a waterfall and that was going to be it. And, Whatever, it didn't yeah. happen. Anyway, I would say that the story of the prequels, especially if you have libertarian leanings, is an incredible story of accumulation of power and how things can flip and the good guys become the bad guys and manipulation of governments and not giving too much power to one central authority and all of those things. So at a political level, I think the prequels are actually pretty great. Um, I thought that... Um, the Force Awakens was actually pretty great too. Yes, it's derivative, of course. Last Jedi was horrible. It was an SJW nightmare, and it and it crapped on the entire series. I mean, everything about it was terrible. Every you Matt's, know, there's Matt's no back there. So, yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. with me, man? Yeah, yeah. It, it was a nightmare. It was painful for me to watch. I mean, it was truly painful. You yeah. know, everything that that first off, there's no force in space. Leia suddenly can use the force in space. Purple haired Laura Dern. I mean, it just made no sense. Why isn't that Admiral Akbar? That should have been Admiral Akbar. You think he's old and doesn't know what he's doing anymore, and you have a half hour like Akbar doesn't. He's losing it, and at the 
last second, Admiral Ackbar, this great, you know, cult hero, he's the one that should have drove the, the drove the ship through the the other ship. Thank you. He's with me. Um, you know, the the all just the SJW stuff, and that they frame it that the First Order is this like basically a white supremacist organization. Although they've got one Asian guy, and you know that the rest is this ragtag, right, right. you know, multicolored, multicultural. It just. It was so pandering, and, and who the hell is Snoke? I think now we're going to find out. So I'm very happy about the Palpatine laugh, and it would make sense because you could throw it back to uh, Darth Plagueis, the story of Darth Plagueis that Palpatine tells Anakin in Revenge of the Sith, and I would much rather continue talking about this than anything else that we're yeah. going to bring up for the next 45 minutes. So, Matt, yeah, I, and I could do far more on that, yeah. So, so Vitagli wants to take my spot Yeah, yeah, right you, now. Want to, you want to jump in <laughs> here? Just, well, all right, I'll get drinks just, with him later. We'll talk about this. this but, uh, but, but, I, but I do think, I will say one other thing. I actually do think that J.J., if anyone can save this thing, if anyone yeah. can tie this thing up and get it right and cares about the original story and all of those things, J.J. is the guy to do it. So I have... I have faith, so to speak, that uh, well, we need that to tell we need to tell our our Trump friends that this this horrible saga all started with a trade war. Yeah, and I'm I'm a little concerned about that because um, I don't know what that makes China in this analogy, <laughs> but it may not be a good thing for the United States. Yeah, but you know, isn't that f- actually kind of cool from a libertarian perspective? That it, I don't know George Lucas's politics per se. Yeah, um, but he really wrote an incredible story about accumulation of power and that how once that power has been centralized, what do you do? You just shut off the droid army. And, yeah. now the, and now the clones who were supposed to be the good guys are the bad guys. I mean, that is an incredible metaphor for, I think, probably most of the things that we believe in. And it's, so it's unfortunate that through some stiff dialogue and some bad acting, that gets kind of lost. But as I said, I do think as the years go by, there will be an attachment to those things. And yeah, you got to get over the the pod race and, you know, and Jar Jar and a couple other things. But the story itself, it's got the right beats, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and you know, like this Star Wars, but there's all sorts of science fiction genre stuff that all has a very libertarian, oh, yeah. anti-authoritarian theme. You know, my... My gateway to this stuff was reading the liner notes on a Rush album, which was a. Am I allowed to say this anymore? Matt gets mad because I repeat myself. <laughs> but it's it's a science fiction story about this authoritarian priest who who impose a top down, one size fits all vision on society. Yeah, and it's sort of ripped off from from Ayn Rand, but. Well, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but I mean, Ghostbusters is the greatest libertarian story of all time. Who's the bad guy in Ghostbusters? It's the government regulator. It's not the ghosts. The ghosts are just doing their thing. Like the EPA or something? Yeah, it's the EPA guy who comes in there, has no right to come in there. And what does he do? He forces them to shut down their thing because they don't have the code that he wants them to have. And next thing you know, the Marshmallow Man's taken out New York City. I mean, that's a great libertarian story. But most of the... Most dystopian movies, and I love sci-fi. I mean, everything from, you know, Total Recall and Contact and 2001. I mean, most of them are about governments that get out of control. Right. And what are we always talking about? Limiting government power. So I, there's a definite connection. If, you, if you're liberty-minded um, and you've got a little bit of imagination, which I think most libertarians do, which is sort of why they care about liberty, because you think about the future— there's sci-fi is like a natural the Venn fit diagram the between Star Wars dorks and libertarian dorks must be I like, get it. it's probably like, I it never, must be like a full eclipse or something I would be happy to uh, to do some research we, we got to run that. the data on yeah, this. yeah yeah but that that's a beautiful thing I mean look how do you you mentioned Ayn Rand I mean how do you get ideas across it's not just that we can sit here all day and talk about liberty and freedom and rehash the Constitution it's that you also need art to help get these yeah. ideas out there so. As I said, I don't know George Lucas's politics, but I suspect we have uh, some insight into yeah. them. And maybe that's why he's quiet about it, because for all the power and money that he has, he's still in Hollywood. And, you know, they, yeah, he, they don't he, take he, too he, kindly to our people. He, he, over would, there. Be, he would be eliminated if he, if he, <laughs> yeah, he would be order 66 yeah. pretty quick. But, yeah. you know, the, like you, you talked about about art. And, of course, Ayn Rand was a novelist and, and movies and culture. Um, and generally, I feel like the left is better than, than we are at some of this stuff. Not much longer. Yeah. Not much longer. I do see that shifting. I mean, look, Hollywood is, is pretty much drying up. The only thing Hollywood can do right now is, is make 
uh, superhero movies, which after Endgame, the next Avengers comes out, they're pretty much done. Yeah, like they're going to spin off a couple more and Spider-Man will keep going and they'll figure out how to give us a new Iron Man or whatever, you know, as the other actors get out of it. Um, but there's not a lot of great original stuff coming out of Hollywood anymore. Yeah, it's all recycled. Comedy, it's all recycled. And, and these are stories. It's not just that they're recycled. I mean, they've told these stories for decades now and most of these stories came out of Stan Lee's mind 50 years ago, yep. you know what I mean? So Hollywood is drying up, and I think it, it's not a coincidence that the more that the social justice uh, monster, it's really the only way I can describe it, the more that the social justice monster infiltrates Hollywood, infiltrates all places of creativity, it's why comedy is not great anymore. I mean, who's... That's a total buzzkill. Like, yeah. how, do, how do you tell a joke if, if, if someone gets offended? Yeah, you got to look over your shoulder and go, oh, oh. I offended that woman or that guy or, or that guy or woman. I can't even, not sure what I can say. You know, it's like, it really has. So there are some comics that are doing good stuff. I would put Joe Rogan at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, but I'm doing stand up again. I'm selling out all these clubs and I barely, I just mess around with the crowd the whole time. And I, I, we, I do this fun oppression Olympics thing where I get everybody to yell out their oppressions and someone will yell out that they got a limp and somebody is, you know, blind in one eye and we, we kind of have them fight it out. And so I don't think it's a coincidence because this, this postmodern oppression Olympics, this idea that whatever your victimhood is somehow gives you virtue, is the reverse of, I think, the things that we believe in. I yeah. mean, I, I don't believe that victimhood is virtue. I, what I believe is virtue is taking control of your life and going to get what is yours without taking it from somebody else. That's virtuous. That's, that's honorable. And that's the society that I want to live in. So it's weird watching Hollywood kind of dry up, but it doesn't surprise me at all. It, it actually makes perfect sense. Or you see somebody like Seth MacFarlane, who's now a big lefty, where now he's saying, you know, his family guy's not going to make gay jokes anymore. It's like, well, for 20 years, every joke about Stewie is a gay joke. Now they make jokes about everybody, right? They make jokes about black people and gays and Jews and Muslims and everybody. And that's the way it should be. That's what actually helps the tapestry of a country or specifically this country, America. And it's like, now the guy's made a couple hundred million off it and he's fit into the social justice thing. And it's like, we're not going to make those jokes anymore. So it's like, well, all right, you're not going to make gay jokes, but are you going to still make Jew jokes? Are you going to still make black jokes? Like, how do we, can we get the list of what's okay and when is it okay? And are you going to return all that money? You know, or, or even the Simpsons that were- I, I miss Apu. Yeah, it's like Apu, the heart, I mean Apu. Yeah. The hardest working guy in the Simpsons who was- an immigrant, I mean, I'm, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure, the, the Who Needs the Quickie Mart episode, he teaches Homer why he shouldn't be racist, in effect, and why right. he should be pro-immigration. He's loved by everybody. They teach you about Hinduism, about veganism, that he has an Indian wedding, his family, they're welcomed into the community. And what's the social justice warrior response? Get a poo off the show. And then Hank Azaria, who's probably the greatest voiceover actor of all time, has to basically apologize for doing a poo. And it's like, yeah. what, what are you people talking about? Actors are supposed to act. Should only Indian people be able to voice Indians? Should only gay people be able to act as gays? Wh whatever it is, it's just, it's it's really, it's a it's a mind infection that is just running rampant all over the place. And it's uh, it's bizarre and chilling and dystopian and what, we gotta so, fight so it. So what's it like doing stand-up again? That Because it's been like 10 or 15 years since you've done it, right? Yeah, so I took off about six years. So I did stand-up for about 12 years in New York and then when I moved to LA and I started doing my show, I was just going in another direction. Um, so I took literally six years off and it's weird because now they can put my name up and we sell out clubs where when I was in it, when I was really like in it, you know, I lived that life of a struggling comic and I was handing out tickets in Times Square and all of that. It's a horrible life. It really is. Um, but I, but I next to the naked cowboy. Yeah, literally. I mean, I was right there. Yeah. I, I ran clubs with a bunch of other comics right in that Times Square, you know, 42nd, 43rd Street area. I just walked by one of them uh, this morning, actually, in New York. Um, but when I was doing it, it's like I needed it. You know, you, you need it as an artist, whatever you're doing when you're when you're in the thick of it and you need the struggle and you need the pain and all that. And it's weird because now I'm just having a ball doing stand up. I mean, as I said, I just crack. A, I crack a couple jokes, but really I get up there and I do some of this SJW stuff, and I kind of talk about what's in the news, but I just have fun with the crowd. I yeah. really just have fun. It's it's not a normal stand up show by any stretch, um, which well, I'm fine with. And I don't. And I'm just doing it. I'm truly just doing it because I enjoy it now. Well, truly. it's probably part of this. Um, you know, I call it almost a counterculture because you know there's yeah there's there's the art part of it, but there's also the community part of it. One of my missions in life is to take back some of these very precious words and concepts and. And the thing about Star Wars dorks, the thing about here, Young Americans for Liberty, 
there's there's something valuable about getting together and realizing you're not the only person that's thinking like this yeah. and wanting to do this sort of stuff. And and I have a theory to run past you because I you know I'm, I'm huge into uh, the democratization and disintermediation of the internet. I, I think it's a fantastic thing for all of the problems that we'll probably get into. Uh, but one thing that probably isn't going to happen is there's there's probably not going to be another Star Wars. Mm-hmm. There's probably not going to be another Rolling Stones because there's now thousands of bands making beautiful music and we all have of different tastes so we sort of pursue those things. But in, in the process, you lose this this sense of, of belonging yes. to the same thing. Like we all know the same Stone songs. Yeah. We all know that the basic narrative of Star Wars and 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 we might lose that. And, and and so I think people are looking for for that sense of community, which is why they go see Jordan Peterson in Philadelphia or something like I, that. I think it's it's a great point on a couple of fronts. We're losing basically communal spaces that aren't political. Yeah. We you know, like basically after Game of Thrones is done, you know, within the next six months or so, and after the last Star Wars comes out, and there might be a couple other things. We're running out of things that we can all sort of talk about and come together about because everything has become political. I've talked about this with Ben Shapiro a lot, that if we don't have any public spaces to do any, to just be people and common things, you know, it's it's a really interesting point for a libertarian because it's like we want as much competition out there. We want as many voices out there and all of those things. But there is some risk in that, especially as technology advances and we're all walking around with the phone and we can all cater our information and our entertainment and our news. We can cater all of that to ourselves that what's going to happen is we're going to really start living at least mentally, in different worlds. We're going to still all be citizens of the same country, but we're actually going to view the world in hugely different ways. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 because it's like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you had ABC News, NBC News, and and, uh, CBS News, let's say. And were you getting all of the information? Were you hearing all of the voices? Of course not. Now we have this wide panoply, which at some level is really great. I mean, that's why people care about what I do, so I I don't deny that. And on the other hand, um, you know, sometimes I'll come to these events and like here tonight, it's going to be mostly college kids, I think. And they'll come up to me and they'll be like, Dave, you're the only person I trust. And I'm like, holy shit, we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know what I mean? That yeah. is a real problem. Like I'm doing the best I can truly. And I don't lie to my audience and I'll screw things up. And sometimes, sometimes I screw things up and we leave it in cause we don't edit for content. And I, and I comment on it in the YouTube comment section or something. And I, it, it sucks because then my, the people that are spending all day hating on me will always, you know, purposely select that clip and whatever. Um, but this this inability to have some things that we can sort of all agree on, or we're not going to the moon anymore, you know, like we don't have like some real missions. So that's a real catch-22, I think, if you're liberty-minded and you want things to be as decentralized as possible. It's like, what is going to come out on the other side? Now, I would say I'm willing to take that risk yeah. for in the, in the name of freedom, whatever happens. But, you know, it's, it's a sort of like, well... Think about elections even. It's like, don't forget 2020. Let's go, let's let's do a little dystopian future. Let's go 10 years, 20 years into the future. Now everyone's siphoned off in their own things. We live in the same borders, um, but nobody now trusts any election result. I mean, we really could end up in that place. And I don't, I certainly don't want to end up in that place, but I could see how you, we, there's almost no way we won't end up in that place. Right. Because we won't, because we want, that's why I attack CNN all the time. Because I, I desperately wanted something somewhat mainstream to be reliable. And, and all they had to do was be sort of reliable, like 50% reliable, just not endlessly horrific. And they, at, at, at every turn, they go endlessly horrific. Yeah. And they go, they go partisan and they go SJW and they, and they go basically left Democrat guised as we're not Fox on the right and we're not MSNBC on the left. So that's why I attack them all the time. It's not attack. I don't, I don't, I really don't do it out of joy. It's funny because some of my, my, my like best zingers on Twitter will be about CNN. And I, when I'm writing them, I'm always like, this sucks. Like when I press tweet, I'm not happy, but I'm like, we needed them to be better. And, and I think. This will be the challenge for anyone that's a content creator or, or trying to build a digital network or any of those things. This will be the challenge um, to not just go in your, you know, your little rabbit hole and then just stay in there and get it. You know, it'll it'll end up being you'll make money and you'll get audience and all that. But what happens to society on the other side? I don't know. I, I feel like, um, you know, listening to some of your more recent stuff, I feel like you've gotten a little more pessimistic and, and, and darker about what's going on. And I'm. 
I'm sort of here to talk you off the ledge. Yeah. All right. Because I have a theory, and I'm gonna, that would be a pleasure. I'm going to bounce it past you because yeah. we, you know, you mentioned the three TV networks, and 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 I remember. I'm old enough to remember Walter Cronkite telling yeah. us that's the way it is. How old are you? Can I ask? How old I am? Right? Fifty five. Fifty five. Right. I'm forty two. Uh, more importantly, I was thirteen when Star Wars came out. So. Um, those are those are my benchmarks. I was um, one, so yeah. this is we're going to have a generational problem. Yeah, I, I was a first generation, and you were yeah. probably second generation Star Wars. Yeah, but yeah, but we we, we won't judge. Um, but you know, everything was defined for us. We had all these top down institutions, either either government or or social. You know, it could have been a church, it could have been Walter Cronkite. You had these trusted sources that that sort of they kind of told you what to do. And along comes the internet, and it, it, it breaks all that stuff up. You yeah. know, the, the old media cartel is gone. Even the Marxist professor that used to tell you what to think, uh, kids are sitting in his, his audience and, and, and wikiing that stuff and saying, eh, I'm not sure. Right, right. A lot of people died under that stuff. So, right, they're finding Peterson yeah. while he's babbling about yeah, Marx. So there's, yeah, so there's, there's no longer that, that, that sense of, of top-down um, order, if you will, and in the process, we you know we had this sort of romantic view of what the internet was going to do, but but now it's become uh, kind of dystopian, and, and everyone's being divided in silos and and all that stuff. But I think we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, and mm-hmm. I, th- I think the the snapshot of all the ugly stuff is going on now is is leading to something that is is going to absolutely be more democratized, absolutely be more libertarian. Um, and I, I think about this. Uh, there's a Harvard Divinity School study on how young people who were, were searching for community, um, they crowdsource it. Mm-hmm. And they use one, one example is CrossFit, but they use other examples as well. Just people that are coming together um, online, like they, they, they were anonymous friends who, who decided we need to get together physically yeah. because I need a community. And I, I reference, I went to one of uh, uh, Jordan Peterson's shows, and you were you were the opening act. Yeah. What at, what town was that in? Uh, Tower Theater in Philadelphia. In, in, oh, in Philly, yeah. Where yeah. Springsteen oh, right here. Part. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I am in. I forgot that I was in Philadelphia. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was fascinated because it's a it's a concert hall. Yeah. And and I was I was checking out the audience, and I was just talking to people, and they're all new faces. I'm an old Tea Party organizer, and 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 there was none of that. Um, there was a lot more women than, mm-hmm. than your, your left-wing critics would say. Yep. And what's fascinating, like Jordan Peterson is a really smart guy, but, but he's not a performer in the sense that there's applause lines. No, he, he always steps on applause yeah, lines. I always yeah. tell him because sometimes he's accidentally funny. Yeah. And I'll go, Jordan, I never give him advice. Like, who am I to give him advice? But the only thing I'll say is, Jordan, sometimes you're getting a huge laugh. Yeah. But because you're not a comic, you just plow right through your laugh. I'm like, just sit in it. Enjoy it a little bit. But, you know, it's, it's, he's not up there for laughs. Obviously. But they're together. And, yeah. and they're together to, to listen to a guy that's talking about ideas. He's mm-hmm. not pandering to them. If anything, he's delivering a little bit of tough love. And, and to me, that's... That's where this revolution is going, mm-hmm. and and I, it, it's not necessarily defined by a particular set of ideas, but the, but the spirit is very libertarian, because people are are curating their own community the same way they'd curate their own music mm-hmm. in a way that I couldn't have when I was a kid. So I don't remember that night in Philly. Was that the show that Candace Owens yeah. went on stage? Yeah. So so normally when I do the show in, in the hundred plus shows that we did last year, I don't know if I did it this specific night because Candace came on, so I was running a little low on time. There was a tweet that someone sent the first night that we were that we started the tour, which was in Toronto, which is Jordan's adopted hometown, where he's a professor and he, and he still lives in Toronto. And in effect, the tweet, it was a guy, he took a selfie basically with him and his girlfriend. And he said something like, in my day-to-day life, um, I act like a secret agent and never mention Jordan Peterson or Dave Rubin, but here I am around several thousand people and I can't believe it, something like that. Yeah. And I read that, at, I read it, I think, at virtually every show. And the reason I read it is because of exactly what you just said. It is incredible to me. So you're right. I, I am. I would say there's there's a part of me that's that's sort of depressed about what's going on here. It's it's very weird. And and I would say, it's not depressed exactly. I I, w- I describe myself as a world weary optimist. It's just a, it's just I'm an optimist at heart because I believe in the human spirit. I believe in human ingenuity, and I, I believe that if we fight for what we believe in, that we can make the world better and we can be better and all of those things. Um, but this is a bit of an, we're in a really odd time for the reasons that you just laid out. 
But what I realized, and the reason that I read that tweet, is that, you know, most people, they listen to your podcast or they watch Jordan on YouTube or they listen to my show, everyone's doing it on their phone and it's a solo experience, pretty right. much. You know right. what I mean? Like you're pretty much watching, you're on the subway like this, or you're listening and you don't, you could be on a subway in New York City with 300 people, everyone from every walk of life in the in the history of man is on that car. You have no idea if everyone, if, if your headphones came out and it started playing, if everyone would think you were a Nazi. Right. Like you right. just don't know. And that's why I read that tweet because I want to take a moment. I make a point of it. It's like, take a moment, guys. Look around this room. There are more women than you think. There are more colors of people. Not that I care about that diversity, but just to flip the the script on, right, on right. what people say about Jordan. Um, and so that community, I'm extremely hopeful for. I mean, look, we just did 120 stops or so in something like 20 countries. And think how incredible it is that the people in, say, Sweden, the socialist uh, have, you know, haven of Sweden that all the lefty Bernie always says we could be more like Sweden. So I like, guess what I met a lot of people in Sweden who were very concerned about freedom and liberty. Actually, the two shows in Sweden sold out in under two minutes, yeah. under two minutes, two shows in Sweden to listen to a clinical psychologist from Toronto talk about cleaning up your room. I mean, really think about that. That's incredible. Th there were so many people at my meet and greet after that. I stopped it in the middle and I said, where's a bar? Let's all go to a bar. And about 200 people, we took over a bar and it was like, the fact that people in Sweden are thinking the same things as the people in Toronto, which is the same things as the people in Philadelphia, and it's the same things as the people in Texas, that's pretty freaking incredible. So at that level, I'm very enthused. I would say the, the part of me that's not enthused is just that I that the fact that I, I really did predict all of this with the left. Mm -hmm. Every day I wake up and I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I said was going to happen. You can't call everybody Hitler and then expect that things are going to get better. And you can't keep running around saying Trump is Hitler because you paint yourself into this intellectual corner where then if he lowers taxes and he loosens regulation and we don't go to wars and maybe we're going to make peace with North Korea and whatever else, it's like, well, you just said he's Hitler. So you're not going to be like, you know, Hitler actually had a couple policy positions that were pretty good. So they've they've really decimated the intellectual side of the left. And so I'm it's not depressed. Um I'm just sort of sad about that. But what I would say that, that is inspiring is this. I mean, now I come to these libertarian events and, and these events where there's conservatives or classical liberals or whatever you want to call it, and there is this wide, there's a really wide, rich, fertile ground for ideas happening on what I would say is the center right. So to that, to that point, I'm, I'm totally with you. I think something very cool is happening. And we just have to figure out what is, what does it really become? Is this really that the libertarians are going to really have a functional party? Perhaps. Is this maybe that, and I think this is probably a better version, is that the libertarians can really, because young people are now into the ideas of liberty, which is really cool, can, can we maybe shift the conservatives in some places where they've maybe been a little too religious, let's say, on some social stuff, get out of people's bedrooms with marriage and weed and a bunch of other stuff, and can we make conservatives a little more... Uh, libertarian-minded, which is what they should be if yeah. you're really for small yeah. government. I think that's a rich place, but maybe there will be a great libertarian party. I mean, I think there's, so all of it's up in the air. So to that end, I'm actually quite enthused. But all this stuff, like I think I think one of our problems as, as sort of professional opinion makers is that we spend too much time on Twitter. Yeah. So oh, you, well, you spend too much time- As human beings, yeah. Seeing, seeing what trolls say. And mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think normal people are subjected to that, to that weirdness, but- you know, I'm agnostic about parties. I, I don't know what the vehicle is. I, I've spent most of my career actually trying to make the Republican Party more libertarian. So some of my libertarian friends don't trust me exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sort of there now. Do you think that that's wide eyed of me? Because, um, that, because that, yeah, that isn't my home. That isn't my party. It's just yeah. where I now see intellectual rigor. So I do sense that. I mean, I've seen it because, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking for Turning Point and some other conservative events. And I go up there and I give them a lot of my lefty cred. And not only are they willing to hear it, but they keep inviting me back. And I, I, sometimes I'll poll. I might do it tonight, although here we're at a libertarian conference, so it won't really make sense. But I'll poll, you know, how many of you are conservative? How many of you are libertarian? How many of you are classical liberals? And when I do it at conservative events, libertarians always applaud the most. Yeah. Now, that may just be because libertarians generally are more fun or happier or, or whatever. Or, something. They're, or, they're, or they're stoned, yeah, like, they're you know, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. But like... So I'm very interested in, in the place that, that you're coming from because I really think it's something and I would be a little leery right now. Like if I saw like a true 
if the Libertarian Party really cleaned itself up mm -hmm. and had a better candidate than Gary Johnson, who's an extremely nice guy, but a horrible candidate, and was and was just, a, unfortunately, I mean, I've had him on my show. He was a super nice guy. I would love to hang out with him and we go skiing or whatever he wants to do. But he couldn't, um, he couldn't express basic ideas of libertarianism effectively. You know, the cake thing. It's like, no, dude, you missed the point on that one. That's like a basic one. Um, so I, right now it's like, well, if the libertarians had a really functional, strong party, to me that then takes a lot of liberty out of the conservatives. You defeat Trump and now you have an SJW president. So, you know, that's like insider politics that I try not to yeah. focus on too much because I care about the ideas more. But I, I, don't know, know, I, try, I, I try not to think about it too much. I, I spent a lot of time. I was a T, former Tea Party organizer yeah. and and we helped elect guys like Rand Paul and Mike Lee and Justin Amash and Thomas Massey. And those are those are, by the way, the four politicians that my wife and I will allow to actually enter our home. Is so, that right? Well, those are the four basically yeah. that I like at this point, yeah. which is and, if you would have told me five years ago that Mike Lee would be one of the guys that I like when I yeah. thought he was like some crazy right Christian something like I would never believe you. But now. Yeah, he's this a, is what it's all about. He he would never use the L word, but he's he's, he's pretty. Oh well, he's a constitutionalist. Yeah. that's good enough for me. Constitutional I mean, conservative, yeah. libertarian, classical liberal. Yeah. I don't really care how people identify. It's the values, but but I, I've, I'm going in the opposite direction because I'm trying to go upstream of of politics and and get into the culture and, mm -hmm. and be sort of agnostic about political structures. I'd I'd love to see a third party succeed. Yeah, I kind of hate the two party duopoly on on principle and. And oh, by the way, twenty-two trillion dollars in debt is something that I'm not super jazzed about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a that's a bipartisan thing. Well, yeah, that ain't going to be fixed by either of these two parties. No, I can tell you that. No, yeah. and so it's got to be it's got to be some sort of uh, awakening. It's got to be a way that we get young people to to think about this stuff just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think the way you do that is probably not by asking them to vote. You do it by um, making ideas cool and interesting. Um, through through movies and and yeah. and also like this this counter revolution where they're going on YouTube and they're listening to what, what's your longest podcast like three freaking hours yeah we've or done something. we've done some that are pushing on three hours yeah. it's amazing that yeah. that young people will sort of curate that information and and go do it for themselves and you know what's funny is the truth is people always say to me because I guess I was sort of one of the first ones that started bringing the long form interview back. They always say, well, why did you see this coming that people were going to want more content because everybody was going to Snapchat and Vine? And I didn't, it wasn't a calculated decision in any way. All I realized was I wanted to watch something that didn't make me feel like an idiot because almost everything that you watch, you, if you turn on CNN, you will be dumber in those five minutes. You yeah. will watch six people who've never really accomplished anything, most of whom are, are partisan hacks. I mean, most of them are former campaign managers or campaign staffers or Democratic operatives or Republican operatives, and you're not getting anything true. There, you might be able to pilfer a little something decent out of it every now and again, but you will pretty much be either dumber or, 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 or angrier. Right. And I thought, this can't possibly Dumb be right. Dumb and angry is bad. Dumb and angry, bad combo. Yeah. It might lead us to where we're at now. You right, know what I mean? Right. Like so, so, so when I rebooted my show after I left the Young Turks and I moved over to Aura TV, uh, the first show we did was with Sam Harris. And there were so many things happening to Sam where he was a liberal who was being decimated by the left. And I thought, let's spend, I think we did, it was about two hours. Let's spend two hours really trying to, as Sam would say, unpack all of the false attacks, all of your true positions, all of those things. And the second I was done with that show, I, I, Aura had just hired me two weeks before, and I was supposed to be doing a panel show like The View, which is what I was doing on The Young Turks. The second we were done, I walked into the control room. I, I said to the, the VP of the network, I said, that's what I want to do. He said, yep, and, and that was it. So That's awesome. Well, you have to give a yeah. speech downstairs. We could talk about a thousand other things, and yeah. hopefully you'll come back Let's on Let's get this sometime. back to Star I think I'm going to talk mostly about Star Wars now. I'm not yeah. kidding. You yeah, put well, this in my head. Just, just like, let it. me just do Star just Wars. Just do it. Yeah. Uh, give a shameless plug for the Ruben Report, and, and if people want to check out your stuff and they don't know you yet, where do they go? My branding guy is very good. It's RubenReport.com, YouTube.com slash Ruben Report, Instagram Ruben Report. Uh, what else do people, what are, what else are people on these days? What are the, oh, Twitter.com slash Ruben Report. And uh, I thought yeah. we agreed we weren't going to go on Twitter anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, limit tw whatever you do. Well, I don't. I do weekends off now. And you might know I do this August off the grid, yeah. which I've done the last two years. And I come back refreshed and, and more patient and I think more clear and more present. And uh, this year I'm really going to push 
in July, I'm going to really do a push to get people to join me to do it. I want to see if I can get a couple thousand people to really do it. And like, let's see what happens. What happens if you really care about politics and you care about these culture wars and all of this stuff? What happens if, why not August? You know, not that much happens. You know, turns out when I came back last year in September, we had Shapiro, Ben Shapiro hosted my show. So he sat in my chair and he just enlightened me on the 20 things that I missed or whatever. And McCain died. Um, but beyond that, it was pretty much nothing. It was some Michael Cohen this. You know, you realize how it's like day to day people are obsessed with this stuff that a month went by and I pretty much missed nothing and felt better yeah, hour for by it. hour we're freaking out. But if you take a step back and look at a month, not, nothing happened. No, nothing happened. We and, and guess what? Knowing. If, if freaking World War Three had started, I probably would have been able to figure it out. You yeah. know what I mean? Even if I wasn't on Twitter. You right. know, I live in L.A. These people are all bananas. Whole Foods would have been a circus, you know, like so. I think getting off some of this stuff and and uh, and when you're when you're on it doing this, I mean, talking about ideas, because I agree with you, it's I'm, I'm actually not that interested in politics anymore. I'm interested in freedom. I'm interested in liberty. I'm interested in enabling people to do what they want to do with their lives. But the machinations of, you know, 72 congressmen voted for this and this one voted for that. And it's like, how about all of you just have nothing to do with my life and we'll be in much better shape? Yeah. That, that, that appeals to me way more. There may be a solution right there. That is the solution. Stop telling me how to live. Just yeah. go home. Yeah. Go get laid. <laughs> really. I don't think anyone gets laid anymore. That's really the problem. It seems like nobody gets laid. What are you people doing all day? Tweeting about everything all day long. Is anyone getting laid? We now have a title for this program. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.